This week, you will notice that we are honoring our awards recipients a little differently. We have produced commemorative videos that will be shown during the plenary sessions throughout the conference. And I now have the pleasure of introducing our first annual Leadership Award recipient. This year's Natalie Weisberger Paul Lifetime Achievement Award recipient, Linda Robinson. Natalie Weisberger Paul National Achievement Award is the most distinguished honor within the National Society of Genetic Counselors. Natalie Weisberger Paul retired in 1993 after a long career with the March of Dimes Birth Defects Foundation. A longtime advocate for genetic counselors and NSGC, she was instrumental in promoting the profession and securing financial support for projects and publications. NSGC established this award in 1994, and it honors one outstanding member who has served with exemplary national achievements and volunteer activities on behalf of NSGC and the profession. Congratulations go to Linda Robinson. Linda was nominated for the Natalie Weisberger Paul National Achievement Award by Sarah Pierzaday Miller. Linda's career has spanned over 30 years, and in that time, she has been a genetic counselor and professional advocate, a mentor to countless genetic counselors, medical residents, and students. She tirelessly pursues projects that push the envelope for the profession and individuals with whom she works. Describing Linda's contributions and professional experience is very difficult to surmise in such few words. She started her career in prenatal genetics, moved to a public health role, and then the majority of her career was in cancer genetics. These experiences allowed her to be very knowledgeable in many arenas of healthcare and apply this to where genetic counselors could use their skills. While genetic counselors as a breed are a very motivated group of individuals, I cannot think of a more effective and tireless professional than Linda Robinson. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Linda Robinson for this year's Natalie Weisberger Paul National Achievement Award Address. my clicker. Well, thank you very much, um, Katie and the NSGC Awards Committee. This is an incredible honor, and I hope that I've lived up to the expectations of Natalie Weisberger Paul in promoting the profession of genetic counseling. This afternoon, I want to challenge you to think big about the genetic counseling profession. Um, but first, my conflict of interest, I am a consultant for Genome Medical Services, and I'm one of the original developers of the Cancer Gene Connect program that is now commercially available. So considering a career in genetic counseling in the early 1980s was not an easy task. There were only five genetic counseling programs, there was no internet or websites to search, and no one knew or understood what a genetic counselor was or what I would be doing. At the time, there were only a few hundred genetic counselors, and now there's over 4,000. I became interested in the concept of genetic counseling when I saw a film strip in a biology class in 1976. And this was the future. They described a couple going to a genetic specialist to learn about their family history. And the future power of genetics amazed me. As a junior biology major in college, I decided to enroll in a class called Introduction to Genetic Counseling. I had no idea that it was part of the graduate curriculum for UC Irvine. I can't, can't tell you how surprised Bob Resta and the other genetic counseling students were when a 19-year-old undergraduate joined their class. Um, the computer error was my first big break, and my second big break was when Ann Walker allowed me to stay in the class. Um, I had never met a genetic counselor before I met Ann, and then I knew immediately what I wanted to do. I was then allowed to perform my undergraduate research in the cytogenetics laboratory. My role in 1981 was to look at cytogenetic changes in bone marrow biopsies. 
I love the possibilities of explaining cancer due to genetic changes. But I was quickly told that cancer is not genetic, and these were going to be somatic changes. I thought I could be a genetic counselor and work in the cancer field, but was quickly told that that type of job did not exist. If you were lucky enough to meet a genetic counselor in the early 1980s, you had to go to a prenatal or a pediatric clinic. Um, little did I know at the time that 30 years later, I would be leading one of the largest cancer genetic programs in the country. So my career has followed a life cycle. I started in prenatal and pre-implantation genetics. I moved on to newborn screening, pediatrics, and public health. But I finally made it back to cancer. I've learned a lot of lessons in my 30 years as a genetic counselor. But this afternoon, I want to challenge you to think big. So I've always loved the expression to skate to where the puck is going. As a hockey player growing up in Detroit, I learned very fast what this meant. During my first year at Sarah Lawrence, I heard a lecture from Dr. Audrey Malunsky about a pilot program that he was doing on serum screening with AFP to look for neural tube defects. We now had a way in 1983 to screen a population for a congenital anomaly. This was a very exciting time. There were two main pilots in the country, and the other group that was working on this was UCLA. Um, and that was with Dr. Barbara Crandall. Since I was from California and wanted to return to California, I soon knew where that genetic puck was going. And so I proceeded to do my undergraduate research project on serum AFP screening. I love the idea of being able to screen thousands and thousands of patients, because if you wanted to make a difference, you had to think big. So the genetic disease branch and the California AFP screening program were thinking big back in 1986. They planned to offer serum screening to all pregnant women in the state. And this was the first program of its kind in the country and my first job as a genetic counselor, as an AFP coordinator at UCLA. And I was responsible for an area of 100,000 births. The genetic puck was going to be genetic screening, and population screening was now happening. I recently talked to Sarah Goldman and found out that, to date, over 10 million women have been screened through this program, and over 40,000 congenital anomalies have been identified. But one of my greatest accomplishments, according to my children, was my outreach that I did in the local schools. My son was never prouder when he came home with the Dawson Middle School yearbook and saw that two out of four students thought that the DNA experiment that I did with Skittles was the best that year. And since that time, some of my friends, my son's kids, have called me the DNA mom. That's my email, the Texas DNA mom. But it is our responsibility to educate and train the next generation. And this includes both professionals and students. During my job interview at UT Southwestern 18 years ago, I met with the director of the Cancer Center. And he told me, I have no idea what a genetic counselor does, but I was told by the National Cancer Institute that I had to have one. So here you are. Um, I knew there was a lot of work to do in education, and I knew that I was at ground zero. When I started at UCLA, I mean at UT Southwestern, I was the only genetic counselor working just 20 hours a week. Now the program has a staff of 25, including 13 genetic counselors, genetics assistants, and genetic patient navigators. But education was the key to the growth of the program. The total number of presentations done in just the last 10 years with this program was over 1,200. So you need to think big about what you could do at your institution. You also need to be creative. Um, community outreach is a lot of fun if you do it as a group. And when I started in Dallas, within a year there were four genetic counselors doing cancer. 
I started an informal group called the DFW Cancer Genetics Group, and we met for lunch just to exchange ideas. But this group grew to be over 30 genetic professionals, and we started doing joint education projects. One of these projects was to put on an annual patient education conference. This year will be the 11th consecutive year that this group of counselors from multiple institutions will be putting on a patient conference. And these conferences have been attended by over 1,000 patients over this time. The same group frequently does runs and events within our city. My favorite is the colon runs, as you see all the pictures of me in the colon. Um, and our team was runs in the family. So I think as a community, we were making a big difference in genetic education. In 2008, there was going to be a direct-to-consumer campaign for cancer genetic testing in Texas. I wanted to create synergy with this campaign to raise awareness about genetic counselors and the role that we had to play. I led a group that created a two-month genetic awareness campaign to highlight genetic counselors. I obtained a grant from the State Department to redo their website, because currently it was only discussing newborn screening to include cancer. I then worked with a private advertising agency, thus the picture, created a slogan and a landing site that would direct patients to the Department of Health's website. We partnered with the Texas Medical Association to reach over 43,000 physicians in the state. But again, as a community, we were able to promote the profession of genetic counseling. But I learned very early on in my career that we had a lot to learn from other professionals. I learned my first job as an AFP coordinator by sitting next to a seasoned newborn screening nurse by the name of Betsy Phoenix. Throughout my career, I learned how to reach the media, working with my hospital's PR department. A former newscaster taught me how to do community presentations and helped me in giving interviews for live TV and radio. Our compensation director helped me develop the first job description and job title of the genetic counseling assistant and helped me to develop a professional development ladder. So as it, as it is important for us to teach others about our profession, we still need to continually learn from others. So Mary Fivocal last year in her presidential address said, do something that scares you. And I cannot agree more with this statement. If you want to do something big, you have to be scared. And there's three things that I'm scared of. Heights, snakes, and grants. Um, so the day before I got the call from Katie about this award, I was taking care of my fear of heights by climbing Half Dome. Um, and there's a picture of my husband and I when we finally made it to the top. Writing a grant is a very scary thing. And it was never on the list of things I wanted to do in my career. It was a task for other genetic counselors that were far more eloquent and better writers than I would ever be. But I remember my first grant. We had been having discussions on how to fund genetic testing for the underserved in North Texas. And my boss came into my office on a Wednesday afternoon and said, what about writing a Komen grant and funding genetic testing? And by the way, it's due Friday. So that was my first grant, and it was funded. Um, but then I went on and to write other grants. And when I actually totaled them all up, the amount was over $6 million. And so you... So I think you need to remember we can start small, but think big. And these grants were mainly focused on population screening. With my background in public health, I strive to bring population screening in the area of cancer genetics. Our initial experience looking at BRCA-positive patients that were identified through a mammogram screening um, was published in 2015. At the time, we looked at 60,000 patients over the course of 21 months. And we learned a lot from that initial patient experience. 
but we were thinking bigger. So to date, the UT Southwestern program has screened over 268,000 patients. Um, at the same time, we had grants for Lynch syndrome screening, screening over 1,000 patients. And we created telemedicine to re reach the patients in our rural counties, and that was 434 patients that would never have been seen without these grants. Oops. Um, but a new grant that has just started that you'll hear a lot more tomorrow from Jillian Wang at the morning session was screening an unaffected population for Lynch syndrome through mammography screening and in the colorectal clinics. And that grant has screened close to 30,000 patients as well. So if you total it all up, we're almost close to 300,000 patients. But as we developed these population screening programs, new positions had to be created to deal with the volume of patients we were experiencing. In nine years, we saw a 450% increase in our patient volume. And so we first developed the genetic counseling assistant. And so those of you in this session this morning heard a lot about this role. But most recently, we created a position called the genetic patient navigator. And we envisioned an oncology nurse with background in genetics that could talk to all of our patients that had a mutation and to help to navigate them to services on a continual basis. And so this was a much needed role since the number of patients identified with the mutation since the program started was over 4,000. I know one fear that everybody has is publishing a paper. Um, this is a terrifying adventure because we all fear rejection. And I always say, if you're not failing, you're not trying. Um, so I learned to embrace my failure and go back and look at my papers that were rejected only to make them better. And one example was on a paper I worked on on hereditary lung cancer. I was excited about this case report only to be rejected, but ultimately it was published. My pedigree was on the cover of the journal, and this case report was picked up by news stations all around the world. And I'm excited to attend the EBS tomorrow with Dr. Oxford talking about hereditary lung cancer. But I think we all need to think outside the box, because what is outside the box today will be inside the box tomorrow. I would encourage you to take a risk for our profession. When I started doing prenatal counseling at UCLA, we developed a short video to help explain the amniocentesis process. And at the time, this was scandalous. We were not doing true genetic counseling. But we had a heavy clinic load, and we had to look for ways to be able to see more patients. So changing the service delivery model was born out of necessity. When we started the telegenetics program at UT Southwestern, we were the first in our university to offer this type of clinical service, and the first in the state of Texas. We have since moved to doing telemedicine from a truck. And the truck covers an area the size of Massachusetts. And we're able to connect in with this truck and see patients. But using technology to improve a genetic counseling process was initially out of the box as well. In 2008, Dr. David Oyhus approached me and asked me all the different functions I did in my job to evaluate a patient. And I explained that I did a hand-drawn pedigree, I then put it in a pedigree program to make it look pretty, I did a risk assessment, I did a letter, I put everything in a database. And he told me and gave me the challenge of creating a virtual genetic counseling environment. We were gonna change the way that we were doing genetic counseling. And with my team, we worked with a whole new set of professionals, programmers, um, behavioral psychologists that helped us answer and look at our questions to make sure we were framing them in the correct way. We also did a study with the reference below um, that found that in our own group, this cut the time we spent evaluating a patient almost in half. But the time spent face-to-face -face with the patient was still the same. So we are striving to still keep that counseling in the genetic counseling process. To date, this program is used by over 18,000 patients at, just at UT Southwestern. 
and it created a database that allowed us to do multiple research opportunities and publications and abstracts. So this is one of my favorite pictures, and it was a picture of a team building exercise that our group attended. And of course, genetics won the competition. Um, whether you work by yourself or you work with a larger group, you need to recognize that you have a team with NSGC. I've learned so much from my volunteer experience at NSGC. And NSGC has allowed me to dream big. And everyone needs a mentor that will push them. And one of my first push came from um, our regional meeting in Asilmar in California. And I was asked to head the program committee. And that was a very daunting task for me to put together a program. But within a few years, the next thing I knew, I was the chair of the AEC in Oakland in 1999. I have since planned many conferences for my institution, but it was that experience at NSGC that gave me my start. My experience as a board of director at large taught me invaluable leadership experience and to strive to see the bigger picture. It allowed me to advance at my own institution. After seeing the importance of a strategic plan for our organization, I went back and developed a strategic plan for my own group. SIGs are also an invaluable resource because you can learn from others with similar needs. I was surprised that only 56% of our membership is involved with a SIG. So I would encourage you before you leave the meeting to find a SIG and join it and make some new friends. I have recently joined the late career SIG um, as I have retired. Now networking. Um, the annual conference is really the best place to network and get new ideas. And to let you in on a secret, I have never allowed my husband to attend the NSGC meeting. Um, until today, he's here. Um, and I told him that I would be way too busy networking. And he would just look at pictures of smiling faces with a lot of wine in the background. And, but he really didn't know what was happening. Um, I'd encourage you to make new friends at the AEC. Um, talk with poster presenters, and share, share your ideas. At this meeting, I've come up with multiple ideas for EBSs that maybe you've attended, um, found ideas for pre-conference symposiums. Um, I've bounced my grant ideas off fellow genetic counselors that were funded, and developed research proposals that turned into papers. So in conclusion, I've seen the future come to life from my first vision of genetics with the film strip back 40 years ago. And I challenge you to think big. And I want to thank all my genetics family, um, especially my mentor of 30 years, Michelle Fox. Um, we've roomed together at this meeting for 30 years now. So it's been a great opportunity. Um, and to my biological family. I was surprised by my husband and my kids showed up today from Washington, D.C. Um, they've always been very supportive of me. And my good friend Sue is here and she's like a sister, so she's my family. Um, and thanks to my mom and dad who supported me back in the 80s when I told them I wanted to be a genetic counselor. They had never heard of it, didn't say I was crazy. And I know they're looking down now watching all you genetic counselors and just saying, I wasn't the only one that had this dream. Thank you very much.